Greetings, physics enthusiasts. Welcome to AP Physics 1, Unit 3, Lesson 5. And this is the end of Unit 3. So I am just going to be doing a review of what we learned. So in general, in Unit 3, we're talking about circular motion or rotational motion. And we can picture a dot traveling in a circle. If that dot is traveling counterclockwise, of course, if someone were underneath my table looking up, that person would think that this was clockwise. Imagine that if you had a glass table um, and you know we were passing the mashed potatoes around the table, someone sitting underneath the table or, or a little dog sitting underneath the table hoping that we dropped some scraps would look at this and call this clockwise. So clockwise and counterclockwise are not the best uh, words to use as descriptors. You think this looks clockwise, but to me, it looks counterclockwise. So we use our right hand. This is my right hand. So there's my wedding ring on it and I wear my wedding ring on my right hand. Um, so I take my right hand and I have my fingers point in the direction of the rotation like that. And my thumb points up or out of the page. So we would call this out of the page, this direction. Now, because we are traveling in a circle, even if the speed does not change, the speed changeth not. So as we go from one location to another location, uh, here's my tangential velocity again, even if we're going at a constant speed and this arrow and this arrow have the same length as each other, we have accelerated. Not because we've sped up, not because we've slowed down, but because we changed direction. And so we call that acceleration A sub C, because it turns out that that acceleration points toward the center of the circle. And I explained the reason for that direction in a previous video. And I also explained to you the size of that acceleration. The number of meters per second squared is V squared over R. Where the V we're talking about is this V, V sub T. So the tangential velocity or the square of the speed, the speed squared over R, that is the centripetal acceleration. So because we're going in a circle, our velocity is changing. And if our velocity changes, we're accelerating. What direction? Toward the center. The adjective that means toward the center is centripetal. Centripetal. Um, and how much acceleration is there? Not zero. The speed squared over r. That unit, by the way, would be meters per second squared just like we're used to accelerations unit being meters per second squared. I'll get out another color pen. Now, what if it's going in a circle, but it's not uniform circular motion? What if it starts out slow and goes faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster? In other words, its speed is increasing. This number V is biggering or this V tangential, this vector is getting longer as we spin around, so we're speeding up. Well, in that case, there would be another acceleration. So I'm drawing this vector and I'm gonna label it A sub T for tangential acceleration. And that would mean we're speeding up because A and V are in the same direction. It's also possible for the tangential acceleration to point this way, a sub t, and this tangential acceleration, when this is the velocity, would cause us to slow down. I'm going to write a little or in here. Of course, the tangential acceleration can't be both of those directions, but it could be one of those directions. Let's have a little chamomile tea. All right. Now, in a previous video, I showed you three equations that go together in a lovely little set. I always write all three of the equations together, and they all have an R on the right. Do you remember them? It relates the X, the um, 
the displacement or the distance traveled, and v, the tangential velocity, this v in this equation is v sub t. And uh, a, this is a sub t. So I don't think I put the subscripts t there before. I didn't want to make you wonder well, what other subscripts are there. But those are related to the angular quantities, the angular displacement theta, which would be you know the angle from here to here. So if I started out here and I ended up here, this angle would be theta. X is R theta, V is R omega, the angular velocity, and A is R alpha, the angular acceleration. And so it turns out that there are three accelerations that we could talk about in this chapter. There's the tangential acceleration, there's the centripetal acceleration, and there's the angular acceleration alpha. Now, sometimes a problem will ask you to find the total acceleration, and that total acceleration is the sum of these two, a sub c and a sub t. I could add them as, a vector, as vectors, and their sum would be this. I'm not going to label that a sub t for total because, you know, oops, I already got a t. But this would be the total acceleration, the vector sum of these two. I'm not going to add in alpha. I can't add alpha to a sub c or a sub t because they have different units. Alpha has the unit 1 over seconds squared, where these two, a sub c and a sub t, have the unit meters per second squared. And I cannot add two things with different units. All right, let me just say one more thing about this picture. If, um, if I had not one dot, but three dots, let's say I had, you know, dot one and dot two and dot three that were all traveling around. Maybe this is a disc now that's spinning. And these are three dots on the disk. What's the same about all of them? And what's different about all of them? Well, it turns out that at any moment, all three of these will have the same angular velocity. And if omega is constant, then they'll all have alpha of zero. And if alpha is changing, then they all have a non-zero angular acceleration, but they will all, even though they're at different locations, as they travel around like this, as they travel around, they will all have the same angular acceleration. Will they all have the same tangential acceleration? Well, no, they will not. Even if they all have the same alpha, this one has a small r, that's r3. This one has a bigger R, that's R2. And this one has the biggest R, R1. Since they have three different values of R, even if they all have the same value for alpha, they will have different values for A sub T. Hmm. Fascinating, is it not? All right, now, another thing I wanted to talk to you about was centripetal force. So I've got my object traveling around in a circle. And if it's traveling in a circle, at some moment it has a tangential velocity v sub t. Here's the center. If it's going in a circle, I know it is accelerating toward the center. There is a centripetal acceleration. How big is that centripetal acceleration? It's v squared over r. This speed squared over r. But to accelerate that way, what causes acceleration? Forces cause acceleration. So if F equals MA, there must be some centripetal force that causes that acceleration, V squared over R. Now, some people end up writing MV squared over R over here. No, 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 no. Remember, 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 we always replace F in F equals MA with a list 
of forces. And where does that list come from? The free body diagram. So somebody's going to be pushing on this thing. So here, let me just do a quick demonstration here. I see, I want you to be able to see my hand, which disappears with my virtual background. Virtual background. Go away. Okay, so if I'm going to spin around in a circle, so I'm going to spin around in a circle. If I spin around in a circle and I'm holding this pen and I'm sitting on my swivel chair. So if I spin around in a circle and I'm holding this pen, do you see that if I spin around fast enough, spin around fast enough, you could do this at home. If you spin fast enough, the pen will start sliding outward. Now, is something pushing the pen out? No. When I'm here, the pen's traveling toward the screen, and it's just going to tend to keep traveling toward the screen. But that's not, and my hand has turned into this circle. So it's going to slide off my hand. It feels like it's going out to me, but it really just moves in a straight line. So the frictional force that my hand exerts on the pen is pushing the pen in toward the center. So on my free body diagram here, now I'm gonna go back and have my, my pretty virtual background. On my free body diagram, I would draw this and I would not call that the centripetal force. I would say, who's doing the pushing? My hand is pushing it toward the center. In other words, that's a frictional force. So replace with a list of forces from where on the free body diagram, you never say the centripetal force pushes it. No, no, no. In the force sentence, A pushes B that way. A is never the name of a force. It's always the name of a pusher. Who's doing the pushing? My hand is doing the pushing. And we call that a frictional force. So in this case, it'd be frictional force equals m v squared over r. So the m v squared over r goes over here on the right. v squared over r is how big this acceleration is. And this list of forces from the free body diagram is what goes here on the left. So I thought we could do one little example problem. Now, maybe some of you have been to a carnival or a fair and been on a ride called the Scrambler. And the Scrambler is kind of a fun ride where there's two or three of you sitting next to each other. And the person who's sitting on the outside ends up getting squished. Um, but I've asked around and, and maybe not that many students have been on the Scrambler. If you have been, think about that. But I think a ride that many of you have been on uh, is a ride that ends up looking kind of like this, the teacups at Disneyland. Have you been on the teacup ride at Disneyland? If you've not been, maybe you should try it out. But there's this big teacup that's big enough to hold about four people. And so there's a, it's kind of like, you know, almost the size of a small hot tub and you're sitting in there. So there's a little person, here's a head, and then, the, you know, a little neck and then the arms facing in and then you sit like this. And then there's another person. That's actually not a bad drawing. I'm a terrible drawer, but that's not so bad for me. And then there's this other person sitting on the other side. You could fit four in here, but I'm just going to draw two. There we go. Okay, so there's these two people sitting in the teacup and the teacup spins around really fast. And you feel like when you're sitting in the teacup, you know, oh, my head's flying out. What's really happening is this back wall of the teacup is pushing your back. It's supporting your back nicely. And there's nothing supporting your head. So your neck is having to pull your head in and supply that centripetal force. Let's see. Um, 
what's going on here? Uh, we could, you know, I just want to get some numbers and then think of a question. I think it might be reasonable to think of this diameter all the way across. I think it's less than two meters, but maybe not a whole lot less than two meters. Let's call this 1.5 meters all the way across so that the radius is 0 0.75 meters. I think that's pretty accurate. Then it might be 1.5 meters all the way across and 0 0.7 meters around. And then let's just think about how long it takes, you know, when people are spinning there. I think there, there, there at least used to be a little, uh, a little plate in the center here. And the people here could twist on that and you could make this spin as fast or as slow as you wanted. I don't know if that's still the case. Um, but I know it used to be that way. So, because uh, I've been going to Disneyland for almost 50 years now. Anyway, uh, let's say that it's spinning at a rate of one rotation per second. One rotation per second. Now, one rotation is two pi radians, or just two pi in one second, right? Or that's just two pi. And then you know I'm going to take that one over second and make it s to the minus one. So that's omega. So what kind of question could we ask? Maybe we're going to wonder how hard does the wall have to push on you? And does the wall have to push on you, um, you know, harder if you're a big person and not so hard on you if you're a small person? Or, ooh, here's an even more interesting question, because um, we were talking about how uncomfortable this can be. How hard does your neck have to pull on your head? I know that, um, there's some movie where a kid talks about how much a human head weighs, but I don't know the answer. So what is the mass of the average human head? Here's an answer from wikipedia.org. The human head typically weighs between 2.3 and 5 kilograms, 5.1 and 11.3. 2.3 and 5 kilograms. That is a big range. So let's say 4 kilograms. Let's say this person's head is 4 kilograms. So we've got a four kilogram head attached to the neck. How hard does the neck have to push to make that head go in that circle? Be an interesting question and it might indicate why your, your neck is a little tired or sore after you ride that ride. So we've got this circular path and your head is going in a circle and someone's got to push your head. Who's pushing your head? Your neck. So I know it looks like we're calling that the normal force, but that's the neck force. And we've got our four kilogram head and we're going um, in a circle of radius 0 0.75 meters. And we said omega equaled two pi s to the minus one. So my question is find f sub n. Can you do it? So I'm going to suggest that this would be a great time to press pause for a minute or two and at least set up as many equations as you think might be relevant and plug in as many numbers as you have and see if you can calculate F sub n. I'm looking for how many newtons that force should be. Give it a pause. And so here we are back. Uh, F equals M A. F is the list of forces. So we're looking for this force pushing toward the center of the circle. And that equals the mass times the acceleration, which is V squared over R 0 0.75. Hmm. So do I know V? I told you omega. 
but wait, but wait, look at these equations. I told you omega and we know R, so can we find V? Yeah, instead of V, I can write R omega. Ooh, that's cool. Fn equals 4V squared over 0 0.75. And instead of V, I can write R omega to pi. All right. I'm so glad I didn't try to do all this calculating on my calculator yet and get uh, annoying decimals because there's some canceling I can do. So I've got normal force equals 4.75 times 2 pi, 0 0.75 times 2 pi. And it's squared. So I'm going to write 0 0.75 times two pi again over 0 0.75. And that makes it really obvious how to do my canceling. Do you see it? And so now the normal force is four times 0.75. Anybody know what that is? Two times 0.75 is one and a half. So four times 0.75 is three times two is six, times two is 12, 12 pi squared. See how I did that? Four times 0.75 is three. Three times two is six, six times two is 12 pi pi, 12 pi squared. Now you can leave your answer like that if you want, because we know pi is an irrational number, or you can just stick that in your calculator and get an approximate decimal answer. Pi, pi times 12, 118 ish. About 118 newtons. And there you have it. That is how hard your neck is having to push on your head uh, to keep it from falling off. And I just thought that would be a fun example problem, not because we want to talk about our neck hurting but because we want to think about the joys of Disneyland. There's all kinds of rides at amusement parks that involve circular motion, and they can all be analyzed by looking at this F equals MA. So have fun with that. Think around, or you can even go onto YouTube and uh, just search in uh, amusement park rides circular motion. And I bet you'll get all kinds of fun things to watch. And I would be happy to walk you through the equations when we're in class. Okay, that is your review from unit three. That's the end of unit three. I hope you had fun. I'll see you soon in class. Bye-bye.